Welcome to the Family Worship Center podcast. Each week we bring you our message from our Sunday morning services at Family Worship Center in Beaumont. So sometimes we look at people and maybe we might not recognize them. And that's what happened on the road to Emmaus. These guys were walking with Jesus and yet they didn't recognize him. We hope you find this message encouraging. Along the same line that I've kind of been, uh, the Lord just kind of won't leave me alone about some things, about everything. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people that are uh, still wondering, still still got questions about the, the hurricane and why things like this happen and all that. So the title of my message this morning is Open My Eyes, and we're Psalm 119 for a, for a text. And in that psalm, the psalmist writes, and, uh, and, he, and he says a few things that we need to look at. And he says, Joyful are the people of integrity, or people that are upright, who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil. They walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be made ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous regulation, I will thank you by living as I should. That's a big thing. You, it's not enough just to read the word. You've got to put it in action. All right? I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. You ever pray that prayer? Lord, please be merciful to me. And he goes on, he says, how can a young person stay pure? The answer is, by obeying your word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations that you have given us. I have rejoiced in your law as much as in riches. I will study your commands and reflect your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Be good to your servant that I may live and obey your word. And here's our key verse. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instruction. The title of my message this morning is Open My Eyes. Now, when we look at this, you know, there's several different angles you could come at it from. Either whoever's writing this psalm had been there at one time, they had read the, read the scriptures and been enlightened, and all of a sudden they're just, maybe they've grown a little bit cold. Maybe you're there this morning. Maybe your heart's gotten a little hard because of things that have happened. Maybe, you know, there's, there's times in my own life whenever I have looked at it, and, and boy, whenever, um, before I knew the Lord, I was, I was hard-hearted. As I have shared with you, I was a hermit. I didn't like people, didn't like being around people. I, I built my house in the middle of a 100-acre farm. You, my driveway was 1,000 yards long. And if somebody came up there and they didn't have any business, there's been more than a couple of them that got met with a pistol at the door. What are you doing up here? Okay, you got no business here. So that's just a little background for me. I was a little bit hard-hearted. I was a hermit, and I was a very happy hermit. It didn't want anybody messing with me. Well, whenever, whenever I got saved, whenever the Lord came into my life, he broke my heart. Compared to the way it was, it, I felt like it was broken. I, c- I couldn't read the scripture without just sitting there bawling. I couldn't take communion. I would sometimes get to crying so much that you'd do with a, you know, because my heart was all of a sudden, it was worried. It had been so hard. It had been a concrete heart. And all of a sudden, it was just mush. I mean, I could, I could read a scripture. I could read something about the Lord. I could sit down and ponder it. I could be in prayer. I could be taking communion. And I'd just start bawling. It felt like Jeremiah, the, the, the weeping prophet. I mean, I'd just, I, I just go to pieces whenever I would think about what God had done for me. As much as Angie loved me, as much as my parents loved me, nobody has ever loved me like the Lord has loved me. And so I was tender-hearted. Well, things progress and get in ministry, and as I've shared with you many, many times, ministry is brutal. 
It is, it is beautiful from the standpoint that you get to introduce people to the Lord. You get to see them grow. But there's sometimes it is brutal. Sometimes the people that you seem to invest the most in are the ones that turn on you the quickest. Sometimes the things that happen in, in you know, you're, you're pouring yourself, you're trying to, trying to help somebody up, and all of a sudden they turn and go the other direction, and your heart gets broken. And there have been times in this that I've had to revisit my position. I've had to revisit my attitude. And say, God, would you, would you knock all that crust off of there? It, it's getting crusty. I'm feeling crusty. I, I, I don't have the same attitude that I did before. And the only way that that happens is if we go back and take it to the Lord. So maybe the psalmist had been there and, and, and went through that process. Maybe he had read the scriptures and he, and he saw, wow, this is awesome wonderful, touches my heart, but maybe life had dealt him some tough blows. And maybe he'd gotten a little hard-hearted. Maybe he's going back and saying, Lord, there's wonderful things in your word. Would you open my eyes to be able to see it again? Maybe he had, maybe he had experienced just in the way that the Old Testament did. It was almost like um, droplets of rain that would fall and the Holy Spirit would come and, and fall upon certain people. Maybe he had read the Word and the Holy Spirit had come in and it had come to life. Because see, here's the thing, this is a living Word and once you get the Holy Spirit involved, all of a sudden something will jump off that page. There have been times that I have read this Bible through, I don't know how many times now, but several. And there are still, to this very day, times when I'll open this up and I'll read it and something will jump up off that page like it was three-dimensional. It's like, wow, I don't even remember reading that before, but all of a sudden it makes a difference in my life. Maybe that is what the psalmist is writing about. Either way, the key thing is here, he says, open my eyes. And so if we look at that, Paul talks about it this way. In, in 1 Corinthians, he says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those that love him. I think Paul was saying, God, open my eyes to be able to see that. And that can only happen when the Holy Spirit gets involved. We've got, the, we've got God's Spirit within us. And he is able to illuminate things. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. All of a sudden, it's illuminated what was dark before. And so I think that's what Paul's talking about. As we talked about on the, on the road to Emmaus, these guys had somebody that just suddenly appeared walking alongside with them, and they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize that, that um, it was the Lord. And so that brings me to number one. Open my eyes that I might see how near the Lord is. Because sometimes we think he's far away and, and not concerned about us. But the truth is he's very concerned about us. Now here's the thing. Nobody has seen God. The Bible's very specific about that. Even Moses, when he said, God, I want to see you. What did he do? He put put Moses in the cleft in the rock and then covered him with his hand till he passed by. And, and really, Moses got to see the train of his, of his glory. Just like, you know, in, in the Old Testament, when it talks about the temple, the temple was big and it was nice and it was awesome and built as a worship place for God, but yet it's, uh, what it says is the train of his garment filled the temple. No way God could fit there. He's too big. But what, what they were praying was, God, open my eyes and let me see what is going on, that I might see how close God is. So nobody's seen God, but yet Paul writes to us in Colossians and says this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, and he's supreme over everything. So whenever we see Christ, whenever we get to experience Christ, we are experiencing God. In John chapter 14, one of the disciples said, Lord, would you show us the Father, and then we'll be satisfied. And Jesus' answer was, if you've seen me, if you've been with me, you've been with the Father. 
If you've experienced Christ, then you ha- He is the visible image of the invisible God. They are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one and one in three. I don't know how it all works, but they're all together, yet they all do a separate work in our life. The Father is our Heavenly Father, and He cares about us like a, a father would care about His child. The, the, Jesus came as the Savior so that He could pay the price for the sin. Then He left us the Holy Spirit. And what did He say about the Holy Spirit? He'll be with you always. So we can experience Him. So the disciples, here they were walking along the way. This person comes alongside them, but yet they couldn't recognize Him. This is one of these that you'll want to get your notepad out if you care about things like this. There's a disease called prosopagnosia. I've talked about it before. It's easy for you to say, huh? 2.5% of the population of the world suffers from this. 2.5%. It's called prosopagnosia. And the, the literal name of this disease is facial blindness. In other words, you can see somebody and meet them and greet them and then you might see them a week later and you don't know who they are. No facial recognition whatsoever. I'm going to make fun of my wife. She's kind of that way. And I'm kind of the other percent. I'm I'm like the negative 2.5% because I can see somebody, and some of you may be like this. I'll see somebody out in town, and I'll say, I know them from somewhere. And it will just bug me to no end until I figure out where it was. And I'll I'll tell Angie, I'll say, I know them from somewhere. And I'll sit and ponder and ponder. Oh, yeah, she was a waitress at Payway or wherever. There was, a, there was a, a girl that works at the McDonald's there by Academy. And man, I pull up to the window and I'm like, I know her from somewhere. And she used to be a waitress at Payway. I said, hey, you're not working at Payway anymore. And she just looked at me and she said, no, I hadn't worked there in several months. I just remember when you were. I can see some, I get, we got in the elevator one time to go do a hospital visit. And it was a local newscaster, anchor person. Got in the elevator with us. So we got on. They rode up a couple of floors, got off. We went on up a couple of floors. And I said, you know, that was whoever it was. She said, where? (laughs) I said, in the elevator with us. She didn't even know they were there. So sometimes we look at people and maybe we might not recognize them. And that's what happened on the road to Emmaus. These guys were walking with Jesus and yet they didn't recognize him. For people that suffer from prosopagnosia, most of the time they have to take other cues. It's either body language, how somebody walks, or how they talk. They hear their voice and they recognize them that way. But as far as looking at them in the face and being able to see them, prosopagnosia, facial blindness. And so here were these guys and they were walking along with Jesus and they didn't even know it. And see, sometimes we get that way. Sometimes... We're looking for a bolt of lightning, a big thunder, boom, to to let us know the Lord is near. And sometimes because we're facially blind to God, we don't recognize it. This is not me. I didn't write this, but it was so poignant. It says, I saw Jesus last week. He was wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt. He was working up at the church. He was working hard. And just for a minute, he looked like one of our members. But it was Jesus. I could tell by his smile. I saw Jesus last Sunday. He was teaching my Bible class. He didn't talk real loud or use big words. But you could tell he believed what he said. And for just a minute, he looked like my regular Bible teacher. But it was Jesus. I could tell by his loving voice. I saw Jesus yesterday. He was at the hospital visiting a friend who was sick. They prayed together quietly. For just a minute, he looked like someone I know, but it was Jesus. I could tell by the tears in his eyes. I saw Jesus this morning. He was in my kitchen making my breakfast, fixing my lunch. Just for a minute, he looked just like my wife. 
But it was Jesus. I could feel the love in his heart. I see Jesus everywhere, taking food to the sick, welcoming others into his home, being friendly to a newcomer. And for just a minute, I think he's somebody I know. But it's always Jesus. I can tell by the way he serves. See, here's the thing. All of us have a little bit of Jesus in us. And I think the greatest thing that could ever happen in this world, you've heard me talk about this before. I've done a lot of things for a lot of people, and I never, ever, for reasons known to me and to the Lord, I never, ever, ever make a point to to give them my name. Some of them don't even know who I am. They might know I'm a pastor at a church, but they don't know my name. Why? Because the greatest thing that I think could happen to us in this life is for just a moment somebody mistook us. For Jesus. And I do it for Jesus myself. You've heard me talk about it. I've bought Jesus. Through the years, I've bought Jesus a spare tire. I've bought him lots of hamburgers, cheeseburgers. He seems to like them a lot. And I go out of my way not to know their name. They don't know my name, and I don't know theirs. But I often, and you'd think I was crazy if you were watching me, had a little video camera there just taping it. But as they're driving off, most every time, I'll wave and say, Jesus, I hope you enjoy the cheeseburger. Because he says, when we've done it unto the least, we've done it unto him. And what an awesome thing that somebody might mistake us for Jesus or that we get to do something for Jesus. See, sometimes our eyes are clouded. Sometimes our eyes are not open. And so the prayer of the psalmist is, open my eyes. And this is that I might see how near the Lord is. Sometimes we feel like he's far away. Sometimes we feel like the heavens are brass. Sometimes we feel like our prayers are getting about this high and plopping to the floor. But the psalmist in, in Psalm 139 writes this. He said, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride on the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your, support, your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness I cannot hide from you. Jesus is always near. He makes that promise in Matthew 28. He says, I'll be with you always. As long as this world is here, I'm going to be with you. Amen? So the prayer is, Lord, open our eyes that we might see how near you are. Number two, open my eyes that I can see the things, the resources that are around me, the things that you have already put in place, Lord, just waiting on me to make use of them. Again, sometimes we're waiting for that lightning bolt or that big clap of thunder to come to signify that God is here and he needs you to do something. No, that's already been stated very plainly right here. And the thing that sometimes we miss out on, you look all the way through the Word, God God took what was already in somebody's hand most of the time and made use of it. For Moses... He's waiting for God to empower him, make him a superhero. And he says, what's in your hand, Moses? Oh, it's my shepherd's staff. Put it to work. And you remember, that staff did a whole bunch of stuff for Shamgar, and he was one of the judges. He's out plowing the field, and in in his hand, he had an ox goad, which was basically a long stick with kind of a pointy thing on it so that they would goad that ox to keep going. Whenever God called him, what, what, what was in his hand? That ox goad. And that's what God used. Samson picked up the jawbone of a donkey one time. See, sometimes we're waiting for something magnificent to happen, and God says, no, I just want to make your ordinary extraordinary. Whatever's already in your hand, it might be a hammer, it might be a pen, it might be the ability to do something, it might be all kinds of things, and we're waiting for that big lightning bolt to come, and God says, just use what I put in your hand. Guys, you're using those instruments. God gave you that gift. I got a brother that can play the guitar like that. I wish I could. I've tried everything. 
I found out I have a hard time playing the radio without getting static. And, and what we have to do is realize God gives us all a gift and abilities and puts things in our hand and puts things under our control that we can use to benefit the kingdom. God, open my eyes that I might be able to see those things that are already around me. When Elisha, they were, the, the king of Israel was going to battle and everybody was kind of fearful and we're outnumbered. And his prayer was, God, open my servant's eyes that he might see those that are on our side and how numerous they are. And he, all of a sudden his eyes were opened and the hillsides were covered with those that were on the Lord's side. Seeing those things that cannot be seen. Sometimes we're waiting on the wrong thing. Sometimes, you know, we say we're waiting on God, but God's waiting on us. And what we've got to do is realize God's already put something there. He's already put something in our hands. Paul says, I can do all things. By myself? In your strength? I can do all things because God's going to strengthen me. Amen? Amen? So what we've got to do is realize, put our faith where it belongs. Look at what's around us. God, open our eyes to see what is already there. Number three. God, open my eyes that I can see others through your eyes. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 9. It tells us Jesus saw the crowds and he was moved with compassion. Again, sometimes we need to say, Lord, soften my heart up. Because sometimes we look at people, not with compassion, but with contempt. We see all the wrong things people are doing, and they're getting this, and they're getting that, and they're getting too much, and they're, making, they're abusing the system, and all this kind of stuff. But what we ought to do is look at them with compassion. Just like Jesus did. Let our heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. And not worry. You know, here's the thing. If we're doing what we're doing for the right reasons, God's going to take care of us. And if they're doing things the wrong way and not doing it the way they should, that's between them and God. Tell you a little story. Some of you have heard it before. I think I shared it on a Wednesday night. The church in Kentucky, where I came from, we were a startup, okay? I filled out the paperwork. We, we filed for corporation, and, I mean, that was like 30 days in. So we're a little ways along. We're looking for a building. We just managed to get a, acquire a building that was much the same similar construction, but it had been a warehouse. So we're, we're in there, and we're working every day. Well, I heard about a church that was really across the, the road from us, and they were just getting started up. Great people. And, you know, we, we are, as far as I'm concerned, if you're on the Lord's team, you're on my team. Sometimes we get hung up on those names over the doors, and we're, well, they believe, and, and they do this. Hey, we're all in that same family tree. We may be different branches. Amen. And there may be small things that we could agree to disagree about. But by and large, if you're preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified, paying for our sins, making the only way to heaven, then you're on the same team as I am. So I, we, we're having an elders meeting, and, you know, I'm going to, I just felt compelled to do this. I wasn't really trying to be pious or anything, but I said, you know, this little, this little church is getting a start up over here. We need to do something for them. We need to help them. I'm thinking $100, $200, just enough to let them know we're with them, we're for them and not against them, all this kind of stuff. Well, one of our elders jumps in there and he said, let's give them $1,000. A thousand dollars. I didn't say that out loud. I'm just saying it on the inside. Because I didn't want to be the naysayer, you know. And I'm thinking, my gosh, we could really use a thousand dollars ourselves. Because, I mean, we were, we were building and painting and, and putting down carpet and the whole nine yards. I mean, it was, you know how it is when you're doing that kind of stuff. And so I swallowed really hard and I said, all right. On the inside, I'm going... Oh, my gosh, where are we going to get this from? 
So another one of our elders, he jumps in and he says, well, should we put a tag on it like building fund to make sure it goes to the right, you know, thing? And this elder that brought the $1,000 up, he said, if they go buy it up in popcorn, what is that to us? And it taught me a lesson. If we're doing what God tells us to do, they can do whatever they want to with it. That's between them and God. If I'm doing what God says do, then God's saying, attaboy, you heard my voice. You listened. You obeyed. Doesn't matter what in the world they do with it. That's, that's one of the reasons I always, I, we don't make a big thing of, you know, put things in the building fund or this fund or that fund. Sometimes we'll take up a special offering for a van or something. But otherwise, it kind of all goes in the same place to meet the needs of the ministry. That's why our giving is so important. But here's the thing. Sometimes we get so hung up on what they're doing with it that we don't do anything. We're paralyzed because we're, we're concerned about how it's all going to end up. Hey, if God says, give somebody a $20 bill, give them the $20 bill, say, God bless you. As they walk away, say, Jesus, enjoy the 20 And the rest is up to them. Amen? So God, open my eyes that I might see all those things that are around me, all the things that I need to do to be able to do what you've called me to do. And finally, number four. Number four. Oh. Well, it's not on the back screen. That's what was throwing me off. All right. Open my eyes that I may be able to see the power of of God in the gospel. Now here's the thing. We're a non-denominational, full gospel church. We believe the Holy Spirit still works in the church today. We believe that the Holy Spirit does everything that he did way back then. We believe in healings. We believe in miracles. I've seen miracles. Some of you have seen miracles. Some of you have experienced miracles. And sometimes we get hung up on the supernatural stuff and we miss out on the little things. Because the power of God unto salvation is the gospel. The good news. As you've heard me say over the last two years, we are the good news people. We shouldn't be going around and spreading the bad news which is sometimes what we fall into doing. We want to talk about the news and talk about it. And there's, there's reason for concern about some of that stuff, and it doesn't hurt to mention it, but when we begin to dwell on it, guess what? It'll rob you joy. It'll rob your peace. And most of all, it'll keep you from doing what we're supposed to do, and that's spread the gospel. Mark chapter 2 is probably, I always say this, one of my favorite scriptures. I got a lot of favorite scriptures. Okay, I've got a lot, a lot, a lot of favorite scriptures. One of them that I've shared with most of you all during this time is it came to pass. One of my favorite scriptures. Thank God it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. This is Hurricane Harvey. Is, is gonna, it's going to be gone, and we're going to be talking about it in past tense pretty soon instead of, you know, like right now. Thank God it came to pass. But one of my favorite portions of scripture... The story involved is Mark chapter 2. And in Mark chapter 2, we've got the scene, and you've heard me talk about it several times. It's where this uh, Jesus was in a house, and he was teaching, and everybody pressed in. And all of a sudden, here were these guys that had a need because their friend couldn't walk. And they tried going through the door, and there were too many people. And they tried pressing up against the windows so they could see in, and they couldn't get close enough. So finally, in desperation, they get up on top of the house, and they began to pick a hole in that roof. The roofs back in that time were kind of grass and mud and clay and everything mixed together, and they'd have to renew it every now and then. So it began to be this big, heavy, thick roof that would turn the water. And so he had four, four friends that were packing him on a, on a blanket, essentially. And they weren't willing to take no for an answer. 
And as you've heard me talk about, this is one of those times when you've got to put yourself in that situation because here it is, no lights on the inside. There wasn't electricity back then. Probably no lamps lit during the daytime, so it's dark in there, and they're probably looking at Jesus, maybe the little bit of firelight that, that was coming from the fireplace where they were cooking, and here's Jesus in the dark just teaching. And boy, we think, boy, that'd be just a great spot to be. When all of a sudden, a little hole of sunlight comes through there, just almost like a, a laser. Because it's dark in the room, and all of a sudden, they make a hole, and here it comes, and there's dust floating in the air. And eventually, the hole gets bigger, and they let this guy down on his blanket in front of the Lord. And everybody knows who this guy is. He's lame. He can't walk. And everybody's like, I love hearing Jesus preach. But the thing that I want to see is one of them, their miracles. So he gets quiet. Everybody leans in a little bit. And Jesus said, your sins be forgiven. Wait a minute. That's not what he's supposed to say. I mean, you cannot, I mean, okay, as a pastor, because I know how people kind of talk, you can hear, doesn't he know this guy can't walk? And it says that Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said, okay, just question me this. Is it easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or to tell him get up and take your bed and walk? Hmm. Well, that sins forgiven stuff is kind of ambiguous. No way to put any kind of thing on that. But now that walk and that get up and walk thing. And Jesus said, so that you'll know that I have the power to forgive sin." Sir, take up your bed and walk. And the guy gets up, takes his bed and walks. I'm telling you, sometimes we step all over the miracle of salvation, the miracle of a renewed heart, the miracle of restoration that God can come in and take our sin-stained heart and make it white as snow and take that red crimson blood and wash everything away and make it white as snow again. Hallelujah. The greatest thing that we can experience is salvation. Yes, I believe in miracles. Yes, I believe the Holy Spirit still works in the church. But the most amazing thing that can happen to a human being is being born again. Somebody say hallelujah. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. When we go out wherever it is today, and we might we might leave a track, we might talk to somebody about the Lord. We might even take time and pray with them. You might even get the opportunity to say, hey, are you right with the Lord? And if they say no, then you be ready to lead them in that prayer. But whenever you walk away, remember to rejoice at the greatest thing. Whenever Jesus sent the 70 out two by two, they came back and said, "Woo, man, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And what did Jesus say? Don't rejoice because the demons are subject unto you, but rejoice because your name is written down in heaven. Amen. Everyone stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe this morning, maybe you need a miracle. Maybe you need the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Maybe you need to hear a word from the Lord. Maybe you need some revelation directly from heaven. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand up. Because I'm going to pray with you. You can put those hands down. Lots of hands. We're going to pray about that. But this morning, if you're here and maybe you're saying, Hey, Pastor, I, I just, maybe I was there once, but maybe I've grown cold. Maybe my heart has hardened. Maybe I've got that concrete heart and I want God to soften it. If that's you this morning and you say, God, I want, I want God to make my heart tender again. I don't want to feel like I'm feeling. I don't want to be hard-hearted and callous anymore. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? Yes, yes. 
Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you say, I just need to make things right with God. Maybe during all this, and maybe I got off track. Maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe I've been that way for a long time, but I realized this morning I need to make things right with God before I leave this place. If that's you, would you just slip your hand in? Maybe you're here and maybe you're saying, Preacher, I've never made that commitment. I have never made Jesus the Lord of my life. And maybe this morning I realize that I need to. I need that power of God in my life. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? Yes. We're going to start with the last one. And the third one. If you're here and you need to make things right with God in whichever way, maybe you just, maybe it's the first time or maybe it's the thousandth time. Maybe you keep falling down and maybe you, you want to keep getting back up, but this time you're saying, God, I'm, I want to make this stick. I need your help. I just want to make things right with you. If either one of those is you, I want you to pray this prayer. And I want every born-again believer to pray it with them. Heavenly Father, I ask you today, come into my heart and into my life. I need you. Would you please forgive me for anything and everything that I've done that would separate us? Lord Jesus, I accept what you did on that cross for me. You died in my place. You died for my sin so that I could go free and that I could be with you in heaven one day. But while I'm here, on this earth, would you lead me, guide me, direct me, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for loving me and saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap for that. That good news is the power of God unto salvation, amen, for all those that believe. Now, for everybody that raised their hand and just saying, hey, I need, I need a revelation from God. It might be about employment. It might be about relationships. It might be about your personal journey with the Lord. But there were several hands that went up. So again, I just want everybody to, to bow your heads, close your eyes. We're going to agree together. You pray what you need to pray, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to lead us. And Heavenly Father, we, we know... Again, we know what we believe. And we believe what we believe. And we have experienced what we believe. We know you're a healer. We know that you are the giver of all revelation. Lord, that you are the the person that we need in our lives to direct us and lead us and guide us through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, today for every person that lifted their hand up, I'm praying that today you would begin to minister to that need that you would begin to pour out revelation in whatever area is needed. Again, it might be a multitude of areas. But God, you are not limited. You can give us revelation on anything. Again, your word is a light unto our path, a lamp unto our feet. We thank you for caring enough that you will guide us through everything in life, that you will give us a word. And God, we know that one word from you can change our life forever. And so, Lord, we we ask that you would just pour that out upon us in whatever way. It might be that we go home and open up your word and we read something that, again, it jumps off that page at us. It might be the word from somebody that we trust who has wise counsel with. And so, Lord, we, we just ask in whatever way. It might be you talking directly to us. You said in your word that we as your sheep, we know your voice. And we'll not listen to another. So, God, we are listening. We are ready. We are tuned in. And we pray that you would open our eyes to all those things that you've got in store for us. Open our eyes to the things that we need to do to precipitate that. Or open our eyes to the things. Maybe we just need to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We need to know them. We need to know your word. So, God, speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds. We're listening. And we're tuned in. And Lord, I thank you for all the great things that you've got in store. As Paul wrote, eye has not seen and ear has not heard the great things that you've got in store to those that love you. And we do love you. We thank you, God, for working on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for restoration. We thank you for healing. Lord, there have been so many hurts that have gone around lately. Plenty enough for everybody. God, we thank you that you're healing broken hearts. We thank you that you're, you're doing a work in us. 
and you're going to get us through this. Thank you, Lord, that it did not come to stay, but it, it did come to pass. And, Lord, we thank you for all the great things that you're working on right now for us as individuals and for us as Family Worship Center. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. And amen and amen and amen. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Amen. Well, we have prayed, and so if anybody needs anything specific, I'll be glad to go. Thanks for listening to the Family Worship Center podcast. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you each Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. You can find out more about our church by visiting FWCVM.